Hello, everybody. Welcome back to ClapperCast. I am genuinely, like, this is the most excited I've been for a podcast in, it feels like, years. Um, joined oh. by Niccolo Grasso, the icon, the legend, uh, the man who comes on here and just discusses, like, five-star cinema. How are you doing, <laughs> Nick? I'm, I'm doing good. I think at this point, you should just call me, like, Niccolo Grasso with, like, with a thick French, French accent, you know? Right. Like, le, le Niccolo Gra- Grasso. <laughs> Because I'm always, I just realized, like, this is the third time I've come back on this podcast after the i and it's all been French cinema. <laughs> right. I was like, there's, it it's a trend be. now. It's a tra- as it should be. I'm here for the good name pronunciation, you know, just trying not to butcher the names, all of that good stuff. Uh, but no, I'm, I'm super happy to be here. Super excited. Look, long-time Clappercast viewers will know I cannot pronounce English names. Much, you know, <laughs> so imagine me walking into uh, just the war zone that is trying to pronounce French names. Going to butcher them all, but that is totally fine. Um, because today we're talking about the Orphic Trilogy by Jean Couture. Um, three films from across his life. You probably know him best, I assume, from his Beauty and the Beast adaptation, which I believe you covered on Death by Adaptation. Is that correct? We did, yeah, last year. Yes. A very worthwhile um, adaptation of that source material. I would definitely recommend you check out the Death by Adaptation podcast. I'll put the link to that episode below. Um, I want to see the podcast come back one day, but we'll get to it Hopefully. later. Hopefully. Fingers um, crossed. But... Another one of his works, very well known for, is the Orphic Trilogy. Again, three films throughout his life. Um, it feels for me a little bit like a film and then two films connected, but we'll get there. Um, let's start out. We're going to go through each of the three films individually, and then we're going to just kind of talk about our thoughts on the trilogy overall. And let's start back, all the way back, 1930, 1932. It's kind of a debate with a lot of these, what year you actually consider them. I don't really care. Uh, We're starting out with The Blood of a Poet. So let's take a look at the film and let's come back and discuss it. Nick, I'm going to start with this one because, like, yeah. there are times in life where you watch a film and you're like, this is core, like, cinema for me. This is five star. Like, this is something that transcends the normal bounds of cinema. And I'm not even a big fan of experimental cinema. A lot of the time, and I know you love experimental cinema, <laughs> I am very bored by the concepts. I'm very lackluster on them. It feels a lot like style over substance. But here, this thing connected with me. And I think it all goes back to the queerness. Uh, Mm -hmm. Jean Couture, an openly gay man, an openly gay film director. um, And this is an entire exploration about the relationship between art and artists. And specifically how art puts a mirror on the soul and the desires of the artist. And how that can both be exciting that can be good but that can also be terrifying and haunting um i can only imagine in the 1930s as a gay director having these things come up and it's something you see with a bunch of queer filmmakers at the time i wrote extensively about james wales the bride of frankenstein and how that film shines a light on the queer horrors at the time um Mm -hmm. And this film, for me, really spoke to that. It takes a very experimental style. It starts with this man who's creating the sculpture. It creates a fake or like a living lip, I guess you could say. Um, And then that transfers to his hand. And he's initially horrified by this. And he's trying to hide this thing that comes out of his creations that comes both on his art and comes onto him. Um, Then he travels through a mirror and meets a lot of wacky, fun little characters. Um, And just how this film tackles this with the meaning, I feel, and how it tackles what it means to be an artist and for your art to live on. It's something that I'm kind of obsessed by. I just wrote an article all about James Cameron and going through his filmography and finding a narrative within that. That is one of my favorite things to do, both with 
uh, filmmakers, but also like critics, I do consider, I think like this really made me analyze, like, do I consider criticism art? I think so. You're creating you and seeing what connects with someone. I was going through, I have a list on Letterbox called Carson Tamar's personal canon, where I just put like every film super meaningful for me. This needs to be added to it. But like, you can very clearly see themes in my life that I care about, things I am obsessed with when it comes to ideas, when it comes to emotions, when it comes to things that are so relevant to who I am as a human. And you can find a narrative that's almost like kind of concerningly real and concerningly like, oh, I'm exposing a lot of myself by just saying what hits me. Um, but I think there's a wonderful power in that. And I don't know, I just like to start out, I just love this film. I think this is one of the best films ever made. Uh, spoiler alert, my favorite of the trilogy. Um, oh, I'm wow. obsessed. I, I know, I know. It's a good trilogy, though. That's not shit talking the rest of the trilogy. Oh, I know. Uh, oh, wow. I'm, I'm obsessed with this film. Nick, what were your thoughts on The Blood of a Poet? Oh, I, 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 I'm speechless and so happy to hear that, honestly. Um, I, I, I really love, I have to say, like, spoiler alert, I love all three of these movies for very different reasons for each one of them. Um, what I really love about Blood of a Poet is that it's very much its own beast in terms not only of like the, the the lack of a straightforward narrative, not like the others are, you know, like a walk in the park in that sense, but comparatively speaking, this is full on, like you said, like experimental. We're, we're talking, it's 1942. This is a time where you have Bunuel who's making movies, Picasso's making movies, and like helping out and Man Ray, Marcel Duchamp, like all of those European authors who connect in France to kind of create art together. And you have Jean Cocteau who just who just discovers his voice almost instantly. There's something so handmade about it um, that's present in all of his films, but especially with this, which is basically like one of his earliest ones, if not the earliest one. Um, it's just so personal, like you said, uh, and it's so endlessly charming. There are so many effects that he uses here from like in-camera cutting to add, I don't know, like bits and pieces to certain statues or sculptures or or drawings on the wall uh to using reverse footage to kind of just having an absolute ball with surrealist imagery and even then there's always a debate like what is real surrealism if we're looking at surrealism in the sense of like the manifest of surrealism from the 1920s this is not a surrealist film but for today's more broader gener gen more broader definition of surrealism this is definitely part of that canon and i think it's beautiful um especially this was my second time watching it all, all of those i've only seen once beforehand uh and they all went into my all-time favorites list <laughs> instantly like each one after the other um and i didn't know much about jean cocteau as a person and so going into this, having learned more about him and about his homosexuality, I was like, man, there's some parts in here that, that just makes so much more sense now with, with everything in context, with that type of context put into it. Because the, the idea of, it's almost like Alice in Wonderland when he goes through the mirror, the entire sequence. It's, it's alluring, it's appealing, it's kind of like reality, but everything is like the mirror version of it everything is distorted and it's beautiful it's weird and it's entirely queer and there's the attraction to that the allure but also the fear of just the the, the different and the new it's so oh i mean you, you have people like you have men dressing up as women and, and women dressing up as men at the end all of those different elements they're just so i mean boundary pushing for the time 100 percent, especially in a, in a movie um and the fact also just, let's just say it's 15 minutes long, be beautiful, beautiful. <laughs> it's, it's a medium length film, barely feature. And that's just uh, an extra reason to love it. Um, and it's almost, I also really like it. It's still like in that period of cinema where it's transitioning into sound, but there's not that much talking. Uh, it's still, all, it's almost like a silent film at points. So I really love that aspect of it. Oh, 1930 cinema is great for that. I think there's something so remarkable about when the form is unestablished and seeing mm. voices like Kator who are bold, who are willing to push and try to define a form that's not defined yet. And it's just like, 
it's magic truly like if you want to see magic on screen i would recommend everyone goes check out more like 20s 30s cinema um spectacular stuff but i agree i mean i think that you know even past the queerness which i think is a huge part of this there's things here i would say about depression um about even like thoughts of suicide and stuff just like and to put this all in context that this is like his debut film like i think he had one other project kind of before this and he's worked a lot with art he did like plays and stuff but like Mm -hmm. What a bold, like, I could not imagine, I was thinking yesterday, I was like, I could not imagine someone releasing this today in general, much less as, like, a debut feature. That is the sign of, like, an incredibly mature, incredibly aware, incredibly risky artist, especially considering how personal it feels. If it really is that personal, maybe it's all an act, but, like, <laughs> damn, that's, like, incredible. Um, I just, like... Yeah, I, I I, mean, it's so weird that I feel like no one's ever talked about this film, ever. I feel like even in context when people talk about the trilogy, they're like, oh, Orpheus is really great and, like, valid, mm-hmm. we'll get there. But, like, I don't know. I just, like, there's something about this film that, like, I kind of feel like it's, it's like, unbelievable. It's, I, like, as you mentioned, the effects are incredible. The visuals are stunning, pushing the boundaries of what these visuals can do. There's the times when I'm watching older films, silent films, where I'm, like, I remember there's a specific scene in Charlie Chaplin's The Circus where he runs into mm-hmm. a mirror maze. And I literally paused it, and I was like, okay, where's the camera? How did he film this? When everything is practical, it it creates so much more sense of wonder. And there are scenes in this movie where you're like, whoa, how did he film that? What is happening? Like, that's incredibly technically proficient. Um, It's just, it it really is a sign of a remarkable, I think, filmmaker, an incredible narrative filmmaker also, Mm -hmm. even in this film that, you know, kind of abandons traditional narrative at times. Um, I also must say, I love how this film uses art. Um, It Mm -hmm. commonly will just focus on a piece of art for an extended amount of time and just let you sit there with it. As someone who broke down literally crying at the Met Museum in New York City, um, I literally in the Egyptian wing just started crying because I found it to be so powerful as someone who loves a film called call me by your name that also has a focus on art which i would say like now i'm seeing a connective tissue i think between this film and call me by your name a little bit more um Mm -hmm. and someone who just loves art and feels a power from art which is a theme in this entire trilogy um really i love those scenes i i thought that carried a tremendous weight and helped kind of ground the film in this like sense of art and what art is theme of this trilogy is like you know, art is this physical thing, but also it has a soul of its own. It has an identity of its own that's timeless and lives beyond that of the artist. And where's the line between art and artist and what's the legacy of art, blah, blah, blah. I think this film worships art and just John Couture in general in his films worship art in a way that I find very impactful. Yeah, there's definitely something like I, I, I think artists love the idea of immortality of art. But I hate the fact that they're going to die one day. <laughs> and so everything that you make might be your final final piece. There's always that, that kind of pressure, I think, that only increases as you get older in age. And it's kind of fascinating to look at when you watch the entire trilogy in context. Uh, but even then, like he was 40, I think, something like that, almost 40 years old when he made when he made this film. And already there's so many upsetting images in this. Um I think the entire part where he just gets handed a gun and he just like <laughs> himself in the head. And he's like, no, 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 it's, screw this. Like, I'm leaving this mirror world because it's messed up. Like, it's bringing him into a darker place where, yes, like artistic ambition, it will consume you. It will literally kill you, um, which is disturbing. Like, I, I think in a way I was thinking, you mentioned like, how, like this is such a bold debut. Like, I, the only other similar debut that I can think of, and I know I'm biased, it's it's a cliche. It's on the Nick, Nick Bingo card, but it is Eraserhead by Lynch. It has the same like handmade, low budget, like primarily shot in a studio feeling to it. But there's no rush. There's a lot of soaking in the atmosphere and everything, uh, and it's impressive. I I I also think like the boldness of the entire ending, where you basically kind of lose the protagonist, <laughs> where it becomes completely passive. This poet that you've been following, and it's just subject to children playing snow, just just a snow snowball fight, um, and then a chess game of sorts, weird, <laughs> and conventional uh, game is being played, and people are just watching it, aristocrats, and laughing. Um, it's it's so profound and deep without ever feeling uh, it never feels pretentious i think everything that cocteau made comes from his heart and it's beautiful 
he made what he wanted to make primarily for himself almost you never really feel that he's trying to cater to anyone other than his own sensibilities and i think that's so moving about it and also the fact that he's just got his, his buddies and friends to help out on some of these things you know uh it was very nice i went uh back in like late december early january there was in venice an exhibit on lee miller who was kind of a muse of um Man Ray, and she was part of the whole group of friends with with Jean Cocteau as well. And there was actually the part like, oh, Lee Miller is the statue from Blood of a Poet. And it was like a clip of the movie, like uh, a bit of history behind it. I was like, that's so cool. I didn't know that. So just to, to revisit the movie and now actually see those scenes in context again, it was very fun. Um, it's just cool. And that's also, again, something that happens in the other two films as well. You see this element of collaborative effort and people just like him. And you and you read about Jean Cocteau, and you you actually see him speaking. It's just man, he was he looked just so nice. <laughs> it looks like just a, like a nice man. And now I'm saying this. There's probably some controversy I'm not aware of. There's probably some like very terrible thing he did that's just being discovered like two minutes ago or something that's going to ruin everything about him. But right now I'm just enjoying the fact that maybe he was just a nice artist. You know, he was just just a good man that people liked. He's a man I'd like to go get a coffee with. You know, yeah, I would yeah, really yeah. enjoy. I would really enjoy that. Yeah, he's not a beer um, guy. You can see him like in a Parisian cafe, just kind of like sipping yeah. coffee by the Seine. Yeah. yeah, hopefully it would go better than the coffee seen in Orpheus. But um, I yeah. definitely, yeah, he seems like a cool dude, and I appreciate what you said about him making films for himself. We'll get. I mean, it's the same episode. We'll jump around, I guess, a little bit. But like Testament of Orpheus, it ends with him just being like, "Hey, these are my friends." By the way, like I love that about him. I agree, and I think like. There's something so poignant to be said about this man creating art, just bearing his soul for himself, just casually. 1930s, almost, you know, 90 years ago, over 90 years ago, I think, if I'm doing math correctly, I'm an English yeah, major. Yeah, um, And the power it can still have on people. Like, the power I found in this film, not to be, like, you know, self-centered, but, like, I found tremendous power in this film. I found a tremendous soul in this film and heart in this film that I appreciate as a queer person who engages in creating stuff. And, like, I don't know. I think that says something about the power of not just film, but the power of diversity behind the camera and the power of authenticity is that you don't have to create or craft these stories necessarily to speak to others or to create something inauthentic or to hit you know a mark of you know hey diversity or whatever like i don't know i think there's a tremendous power here and i really appreciate that i appreciate this film and i appreciate john couture until the day before this post we find out he's like a terrible person and then <laughs> then, then we'll reconsider <laughs> yeah, right as of now i love john couture um <laughs> we'll see how that evolves. Let's enjoy the moment. <laughs> Speaking of Orpheus, that is our next film. Let's go ahead and take a look at Orpheus, and then we'll come back and discuss it. Orpheus. <laughs> And Nick, I believe, judging by the letterbox, that this is your film of the trilogy. So I'm going to turn it over to you first. Give us your take on Orpheus. Oh man, Orpheus. Well, it's just it's it's beautiful. I I I growing up, I was a massive massive fan of Greek mythology. Uh, in general, I read so much about it. I read all about the myths. And one of my favorite myths, which is often one that's very much derided, is the one of Orpheus and Eurydice. And so to actually watch an adaptation that's completely its own thing, that's completely detached from the myth in a, in a, in a literal way, um, it's beautiful and inspiring because basically in this film, Orpheus is a poet in 1940s France. He has a lovely wife, let's say wife, girlfriend, partner, uh, just living the life of a poet, basically not <laughs> doing much, just chilling at cafes. Uh, and one day, another poet at the cafe is killed. He gets in the car with a woman who tries to rescue this dead poet and he just finds himself in the underworld. And this woman is actually death incarnate and he becomes intrigued by her he starts to fall in love with her 
there's this whole like kind of love triangle between him, his wife, and Death. There's Death's chauffeur who falls in love with Eurydice, Orpheus' wife, and and it's it's like I love this film. <laughs> I love this film so much. Um, when I first watched it back in 2019, I think. Uh, I think I watched the entire trilogy kind of like close to each other. No, it, it was like in the span of one year, I saw all three of them. I think Orpheus, Blood of a Poet, and then Testament of Orpheus. Um, and ended up inspiring me heavily. Uh, Jean Cocteau's style, if, if anyone's watched my short film that I made independent during quarantine, uh, Catabasis, that one has a couple, like two, three references to Jean Cocteau. There's mirrors, there's a lot of reverse footage and things like that, like, and that's not because of other, like, a lot of people say, oh, it's Lynch, it's Lynch. Yeah, I love Lynch, but it was primarily actually Jean Cocteau. <laughs> I haven't had to Are, Is it, it on there. YouTube? It is, yeah, yeah, yeah. All my videos. I need to rewatch all, it. All them, films, all them films are on... Um, Link are below, on, by the way. Watch yes, it. no, I, it's that's kind of fun. Like, even myself, like, I made it... I made that short film with no real... Um, with no real goal of, like, this is the one theme that's present in it. And other people kind of, like... Ex- explain a couple of things but like we're talking about like queerness and diversity like i've i've seen some of that present there as well like a couple of years removed I was like man you can make actually apply a queer reading in here it actually kind of works um and that's the beauty of john cocteau's filmography and even orpheus and especially in here it's so again the myth of orpheus and the Eurydice is so powerful and beautiful we kind of discussed that on the patreon exclusive episode um uh, on on uh, portrait of a lady on fire which is well worth a listen um but in here, like, Jean Cocteau understands the appeal of that story. The appeal of just, you know, you love someone so much. Are you willing to let them go forever? Or are you willing to constantly live in the fear of losing them? And he takes the myth and just goes above and beyond what other filmmakers would have done to actually, you know, spoiler alert, but like, it goes to this entire sequence where actually Eurydice comes back from the underworld and <laughs> she's trying to live with Orpheus in the house and it becomes this like stereotypical like petty couple where they're having constant arguments and she's like nagging him about like the most boring things like oh just shut up woman it's almost like looking at her just kind of just go away I'm tired of you like it's 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 insane like couple dynamics um again the artist and and the role of the artist and and the obsession with death I think like this this is not subtle at all like the poet literally loves death and would do anything to be with death. <laughs> it's just so crazy. And I love it so much. Uh, enough, en- enough for me. Enough for me. I'm super curious to know your thoughts on this, Carson. Yes. I mean, okay, to be clear, I enjoyed it. To also be clear, this is my least favorite out of the trilogy. But like, I mean that and I still like very positive on it. Um, obviously, Kator has a long history with... Um, Orpheus. He transcribed it. He has his own version of it. He did before he even started going into film. Um, I think there's a lot here that works for me, similar to like how a good play works. I think how he, the flow of dialogue, how dense he creates his dialogue is something I appreciate. It's very thoughtful um, in every single moment with just like every single line hangs like a line of poetry in a way that's like inauthentic in a sense if you want to look at how real people speak but like in the context of a play or a film like this that works um, I think creates this wonderful sense of weight to every single word and this weight of thought Um, the one thing where I think oh and and, I mean I should mention the mirror effects are great Um, I think that's such a fun idea using the mirror to go into this realm between life and death Um, and there's so many thoughtful concepts there I mean you mentioned that he's in love with death death is also in love with him uh and there's so much here to like that you could break down and really works for me i think the one point where it feels a little frustrating to me is the weight of the scene where orpheus and his wife get sent back and you mentioned the Mm -hmm. couple bickering and stuff and like that's fun to a point but i mean maybe it's because i'm coming off portrait of a lady on fire that gives this like wildly inspired and like deep and poetic sense of weight to that choice and here it's like well, he looked in the mirror and like, well, I, I don't I don't know. I don't know if that scene holds like the weight that I personally look for in that scene when it comes to this narrative. Um, and there's some little things like that where I'm like, I don't know. But then again, like that's also coming with an expectation of what this is. And if you go into it with no expectation, like mm-hmm. it's hard when there's a source material like this to be like completely just like brain dead. I'm ready for anything that comes at me. Um 
and it, you know maybe it is a little dense here and there but like i don't know i still really appreciate i want to be clear um i do appreciate also that you again mentioning lynch um i i one of the reasons everyone should check out old cinema is like i think it's pretty undeniable that lynch i don't know if he's ever directly spoken about kotor but like i think it's pretty undeniable that there's a through line here. There's inspiration yeah. here. A quick Google search reveals that there is a lot of articles written about a connection between these two. Um, I would be fascinated to hear Lynch's takes on these because it just, it feels not to like film Twitter it up. I think this is the only time I've ever meant it when I actually said it, it feels Lynchian. Um, but yeah, I, I appreciate Orpheus. I would like to rewatch. I think especially these later two films we'll get to. They're mm-hmm. so dense in some areas where it's like, I would appreciate a rewatch. I would appreciate spending time really breaking it down, looking more into it than maybe I had time to do this time where it was just kind of a straightforward watch. Um, but I greatly still appreciated it, even if it probably left me the coldest. It's also just like the most traditional narrative. It's the most traditional, I mean, like structure, thoughts, I would say, most traditional expression. Um, mm-hmm. So maybe just compared to the other two that are rather inspired entries, it just left me a little bit more cold. Still definitely good. Um, but it, for me, it was a little bit lesser. It's very verbose. Um, I'll say both are like even Testament of Orpheus. There's a lot, lots of talking, lots of talking. <laughs> but especially in Orpheus, definitely. Like I was even looking at this filmography. I haven't seen. I hate that that I haven't seen uh, the Eagle with Two Heads and the Storm Within uh, yet because I've, I've been, they've been on my watch list since like 2018, 2019 or something. Uh, um, but definitely, like compared to Blood of a Poet and even Beauty and the Beast, which is also not excessively talky. There's talky bits, but there's a lot of more expressionistic imagery. Uh, in here, there's definitely moments where it's just kind of like, you know, this is people talking, this is this is a talking scene, <laughs> and then we get to this to this real scene and the, and the weirder scenes. Um, but still, yeah, there's, there's an interesting rhythm. I, I think what's very disorienting, in a way that I appreciate, is the entire structure of it, because it, it's very playful with, with the original myth, in a way that so many, that I find that aspirational, because I've been working on an adaptation of the Orpheus and the Eurydice myth for like two years at this point. Like my, time has been like just just conceptually. Um, it's hard, it's expensive, I want to make it well, I don't want it to be a rushed job, which is why I haven't shot it yet. Um, but rewatching something like this, like this is why I love doing this because like I watch John Cocteau, it just gets my, my, my fire going creatively because he knows how to create something that's familiar but also wholly unique. I've never seen anything like this before. Um, and I don't think many other filmmakers have been able, there's a couple instances, I think, uh, with like taking mythology and folklore and updating it to something new. Again, we talked about Portrait of Eden Fire is an excellent example of that with the same myth. Uh, but in here, it's just, oh man. I do wonder, like part, part of me wonders if, probably the only thing I'm not a big, big fan of is the actual ending of the film. Even though I can rationalize it and intellectualize it because it's like okay the actual Eurydice ends up being death where she's the one who has to let go of him and everything that's that's in life like if she wants to stay with him like the truest form of love is letting go um which is true unfortunately um i wish it weren't but that's that's a fact sadly uh and i was him like yes i get it and it's also you know orpheus and eurydice are together at the end and there's a very like passionate speech that he makes where oh the true love that we have for each other is wonderful yada yada i don't know it's it's, <laughs> It's not the case, but it feels almost like a studio mandated ending. You know, I can kind of see someone being like, and Orpheus stays in the underworld, and Cocteau is like, yes, beautiful. And this is like, nah, 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 nah. Jean, 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 Jean. You change it, please, Jean. See the play, change it. And it's like, okay, well, fine. And he does it. It's like, I don't know. It, it just, I, I get it. I get it. I think it's, it's kind of sad that there's this whole like lore as well in the underworld, but where they go is kind of like a limbo and there's like a prison in the underworld like you can actually get arrested and that's like jail jail this is like for 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 eternity it's crazy it's fascinating it's just so creative um but yeah i don't know how you feel about the ending but it just kind of sits weird for me it's almost a bit too nice even though i yeah. love how he reuses you know the previous entrance of orpheus is just played in reverse with the chauffeur, just kind of like gently pushing him away. I think that's so beautiful, so powerful. But yeah, I don't know. 
Yeah, no, I, I mean, I agree completely. I think that kind of speaks to what I was saying about, like, I think that third act in general, I think it's, like, wildly creative, but there are those bigger mm-hmm. moments where it feels like, oh, I feel like I should be having, like, a gut punch reaction to this, and I don't have that reaction. Like, I appreciate it. I don't think it's, like, a disaster or anything, but, like, it certainly feels like there are options that could have held a little bit more weight or a little bit more venom, I think, specifically. Um I completely agree with that. Um, totally fine. If not, do you want to do one day a Patreon episode on those last two couture films that That'd you mentioned? Interesting. Yes, I need. An I would love to, to do that. Them. Me too. Because I, I I was looking through a smog. I was like, oh, I really want to watch these. So we'll schedule that for sometime later this year. Because I would love to do that and bring that to the Clappercast Patreon. Yes. Um, but yeah, I'd certainly agree. I think that. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think this is, again, wildly creative, works a lot of the time, again, shows Katora's specialty as both a visual filmmaker and when it comes to writing. But I agree, I think there's just some of those moments where it just leaves me a little bit colder than I would like. Um, but still not bad. <laughs> still still wildly impressive. I couldn't make a film like this. I know I couldn't. <laughs> and I, I think 90% of filmmakers couldn't. So um, I appreciate it. The radio, like something that, should, that could, could be so silly mm. in other movies. Like, I, I, again, like I, we kind of mentioned it with a lot of a poet in this one as well. But like we cannot understate how playful these films are. How he doesn't take himself overly seriously. Despite having very dense subject matters that it just embraces full, head on. Just like the weight of life and art and immortality and death and all of that and love but he also has fun (laughs) he also has fun it's just just like the images of jean marais as orpheus just kind of like uh sitting in a car like you know i'm trying to find a radio station i'm listening but if i go to sleep this is gonna play i'm gonna lose it like those things are kind of silly and he knows it and he plays it but orpheus your wife is dying your wife is oh she's acting it's nothing no it's so good it's like yeah it is really funny it has it also just has such great comedic timing specifically like Mm -hmm. yeah it really is impressive but it never hurts the weight of the film never hurts the impact of it like mm-hmm. it holds those two incredibly well and i think kotor just understands how flows of emotion work to where like he can interject all these things and make them all work also just like a tremendous romance thrown in there that probably shouldn't work that well that like when him and death like embrace it's like oh god oh. like this is fucking oh. phenomenal um it's just it shouldn't work as well as it does but God, does it work? Um, and also the acting. I think the performances in this are, like, spectacular. I really want to give, like, special credit for. Um, I'm not, you know, going to try to pronounce these names. But the guy who it. plays Orpheus. Yeah. The guy who plays Orpheus. Jean-Marie. Absolutely. Jean-Marie. The charisma. The swagger. The presence he has from the first moment. I mean, there's something about, like, just unbelievable <laughs> the unbelievable leading man who should have been in everything and just like should have been one of the defining actors of this era because it's like fucking phenomenal um yeah. also a queer actor as well oh i didn't know that that's yeah. fascinating I, I don't know if they were ever together but there was definitely a good feeling with with cocteau uh because he was also in beauty and the beast he plays yeah he the was beast. the beast and then the, the, the shitty wow. boyfriend wannabe boyfriend as well which is another like impeccable dual performance just just a transformer like yeah. he's such a such a face you yeah. know it's so distinctly unique it's yeah. so expressive and it's 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 he manages to shift from being kind of like this down on his luck likable poet to this pretentious hassle yeah <laughs> and the face always works like sometimes you want to hug him sometimes you want to slap him <laughs> just like care about your wife damn it Right, a child on the way, like all those things. Yeah, yeah it's about how you both like simultaneously judge him because he's like not there for his wife and is kind of an idiot, but also like you absolutely empathize and understand with him when it comes to his obsession with death and his love for death. Mm-hmm. Um, I I really need to rewatch Beauty and the Beast. I watched that a couple years ago. I didn't know any of the queer elements. Like I I really watched that thing like blinders on, no context. I think it would be like I don't know. I need to rewatch it. I think I would enjoy it a lot more, even <laughs> though I enjoyed like it a lot the first pie. time. I'd, I'd say, yeah. like, yeah, my favorites of Cocteau, Beauty and the Beast, and Orpheus. But I'm, my, actually, Beauty and the Beast might be a little, like, have a little leg up uh, compared wow. to this, I think, for me. Just the ending. I think the ending is beautiful of that. Uh, yeah. It just goes cuckoo banana crazy with, with <laughs> symbolism and other things. But anyway, 
Yeah. I'm not well, talking about that. <laughs> no. Moving on to, the, I think, the last film of the trilogy, made about 10 years after Orpheus. We have The Testament of Orpheus. Hey, let's take a look at it. Shocking. We're doing it three times this episode, and then we'll come back and discuss. <laughs> Faites semblant de pleurer, mes amis, puisque les poètes ne font que semblant d'être morts. Okay, this is kind of the Avengers Endgame of the trilogy. Um, yeah, I truly. didn't know what to expect, and I will say it's a cruel punishment to put on a critic or anyone to talk about this film after one viewing. Because the first <laughs> viewing is like truly just like you feel like you've been on a boat that's sinking and you got thrown off and you tread water and then you like somehow made it onto a lifeboat. And then they're like, here, talk about this intense thing. Like it is a very complex narrative where John Couture is in it. He plays himself um, and he goes through and he meets this professor and then he he meets people from Orpheus and then they have a bunch of conversations and it's incredibly dense and complex material that blends kind of the souls, I would say, of Orpheus and the blood of a poet. Though I don't see a ton of the blood of a poet. I don't really know why that is. Like I get thematically, I guess, a look at art and the artist. I don't fully know if I see the connection where I'd say, like, oh, what a trilogy. Um, but uh, still, this film, initial reactions, very good, very unique. Um, I think especially, like, there's something to be said that he knew pretty much this was going to be his last film, other than, I guess, like, a rant he made talking to people from the year 2000 that they found. Uh, <laughs> but this is his last, like, traditional narrative feature. He definitely goes out with a bang. I think the um, sets, I don't know where they filmed this. I don't know if it would like the ruins that he uses when he goes into a space between life and death is really fascinating. Using a lot of the concepts from Orpheus, really strong, um, but a lot to take in. I will say like, I never found Orpheus to be too dense of a film. I thought it was dense, but in a proper way. There are moments here where on a first viewing, at least, it is a little like hard to understand even what's being talked about, much yeah, less yeah. like put it all together. Um, but I definitely enjoyed this one. I think there's just so much here. And it's a film that I know I'm going to be revisiting. As with probably all these films, this is one of those like trilogies where I could see myself like just rewatching it immediately. Um, I think there's a lot here and a lot to pick at. What were your thoughts, Nick? It's 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 a lot. Um, actually, funnily enough, before this rewatch, this was my favorite Sean Cocteau film. Um, I really connected with it on the first viewing, and revisiting it, I still really love it. It's just 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 meandering and completely self indulgent. Uh, in a way, that's fun, that's enjoyable, but still, like like you said, there's a lot in here, a lot, a lot, a lot in here to unpack. Um, I, th I think what's what's key for me is just the idea that Jean Cocteau knew he was dying, basically, because he died like three years after he completed this film. Uh, his health was starting to get worse and worse. He started having like heart issues. He actually died of a heart attack at like a couple in 16, 19, uh, 1963. Um, and so for him to actually say, you know what, I'm just going to look at my at my body of work, my entire filmography, uh, and, and, and just... And just my life and my art and what I believe in, and I'm this this immortal ghost just wandering through time and space, talking to this kid who becomes a professor later on in life. And it's uh, I don't know, it's it's filled with cameos and like even even the little kid at the beginning is Jean Pierre Law, who played the kid from Six Hundred Blow, Four Hundred Blow, sorry, and still alive today. Um, there's Yul Brenner is in here, Pablo Picasso, Brigitte Bardot, just like, just just a flex for him. Be like, oh yeah, there's going to be a funeral for me, and if there is, there's going to be all these famous folks because I'm friends with them. Like, it's insane. But but as a, as a movie, that's a trilogy ender. Again, like, I've never seen anyone being like, oh, I'm just going to actually put myself in a movie where I talk 
to fake versions of fictional characters that I created where they're neither the actor nor the character. They're just weird beings. They <laughs> are the art. He, he, that's the, he's, not the even art talk, yes. he's not talking to like Orpheus, the character, who's like, oh, I'm here from the second film. Like mm-hmm. He's talking to the concepts and the art that he created and having intellectual dialogue about like their existence which is insane <laughs> which is great but insane <laughs> yeah like when he talks to the fictional to like the character who suggests uh, who's played by Edward Vermeer uh it just comes al- comes alive from the water or whatever uh and Jacoto is like wait you were blonde in the movie and he's like well that's 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 movie's not real life this isn't even real life you know <laughs> I'm not even real. <laughs> it's like, what the fuck? What's happening here? Like, it's so bizarre. Um, but but it, but it works. It makes it work. It makes it work in a way that's... It, it, it makes me think about other similar... Other movies that have tried something similar. I think, like, right now it's coming to mind. I would say The Irishman, in a way. Um, the House That Jack Built by Lars von Trier. Like, movies where... Especially The House That Jack Built. Like, a director sitting down and being like, I just got to put myself it's going to be judge during the executioner uh and that's what he does literally in this scene like jean cocteau actually has a jury with death and the other characters from his film from orpheus just meeting again um i think what's what's interesting with with blood of a poet i think that's like it's called the orphic trilogy there's not much orpheus outside of potentially talking about you know underworld coming and going back from a place <laughs> um but it feels more stylistic i'd say because the other movies that he's made are not shot or edited in the same way that these three are um and even testament of orpheus has a lot of visual uh like parallels to blood of a poet i'd say um where it's probably like the biggest connection that kind of ties everything together um but also like you mentioned earlier talking about that film like the the artist like obsessed with death obsessed with with art the immortality of it and accepting the immortality of the artist it's it's beautiful and there's so many self-indulgent moments that again he's making just for himself there's this whole like I don't know, three minute long sequence, four minute long sequence of him putting together a broken flower that goes on for hours. It's so slow. It's so, so slow in this film. It's like a reverse shot of him kind of peeling it up. But it's lovely. It's You have like nice music in the background. It's very, it's very chill, very quiet, it's very comfy. The entire movie is just, it's like a it's like very cozy, like a warm embrace, uh, which also ties with the ending of it, which I think... With someone like again, like how does an artist feel about themselves? And I think most artists feel that they don't deserve the love and acclaim the that they have received in their life. Most artists, unless you're like a Tarantino, they're not full of themselves in that way. They're not excessively egotistical, and they kind of embrace death and their own condemnation. And while you have Lars von Trier who actually dies trying to achieve, you know, redemption of sorts. Sure. Uh, here you have Jean Cocteau literally being like, oh, the, the two riders, the horsemen, they're here for me. They're going to kill me. Just like, I'm ready. And it's like, nope, that's just that's just the popos, you know? And they actually kind of want an autograph of yourself. But no, he's gone. He's, he will live forever in everyone's mind uh, as this ethereal figure uh, through his art. Like his art literally takes him away from the real world and brings him to the other place like it's it's a such a beautiful ending i think that's why i, I loved it so much the first time around um yeah. i definitely think it's a flawed movie but yeah how do you feel about the ending and all we're that? doing the thing on clappercast where i talk about a four-star film and then i'm like oh maybe it's five stars <laughs> um yeah i mean not to just echo you completely but like i i don't think there's another piece of another artist another piece of film that tackles something like this where like he truly is coming to terms with not just his death, but the fact that he isn't dead. The fact that he lives in this plane because of his art. Um, and I, there's a, so much here just about like, even just about like the state of art. There's that statue that you feed it autographs and it will print out like poetry and stuff. Like there's so mm-hmm. much he is tackling here um, that just clearly is so personal to him. 
um, and clearly means so much to him. I think the visuals, I mean, as I mentioned, like all these have great effects. This one, I'll say, is the cleanest. Uh, when someone fades oh, yeah. out, it's not just like a weird cut where everything shifts a little bit. Like it <laughs> looks really good. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm just kind of obsessed. I think, like, I kind of think I might just rewatch this today. Like, I'm kind of obsessed nice. with this idea of just like having this piece without ego and just for fun and just having your friends come and truly give a final statement on like because i i think Kator uses i would say this in uh blood of a poet uses cinema as a form of i guess you could say like therapy to cope with things <laughs> i think it's very interesting seeing the progression from a blood of a poet where it feels very much so like an artist making art coming to terms with what it means to be an artist for good or bad to this where it's this reflection on it rather than just being pure in the moment and this acceptance of it and working towards acceptance i think thematically maybe i underestimated on a first watch how thematically i think those films are tied and how it shows an evolution of a soul and a person made like 30 years apart so that's only natural um yeah, I, I don't know. Like, I just, I mean, I, everything you said is absolutely true. Um, I, I just think it's absolutely marvelous. And I guess just um, what it ends on is this really beautiful note of just he lives on, right? We're talking about him. And it's weird. Also, then you start thinking, you start thinking there's going to be a time 60 years after I die that like, depending how the world, I mean, assuming technology is still going, assuming YouTube servers are still on, like <laughs> us talking about John Gator right now, will probably still be alive in some form. And then that's strange to think about. Does anyone truly die? Who knows? Right? Like, I don't know. I think that's such a fascinating idea. Um, it's one I wrote about for university. We had um, a pro I was in this class for uh, informal essays and we had who's here with us now and I wrote this whole thing about why it's important to teach like diverse literature because it keeps these perspectives mm -hmm. alive and I was specifically referring to Herculean Barbin I don't know if you read it or anyone else has ever read this um, but so. it's the journal of an intersex individual and I remember <clears throat> writing about that and being like oh it's so important because she's like here and alive and if we stop talking about them they die forever um, and that's very much so kind of what Katora is like talking about here um it's just yeah i don't know it, it, it's fascinating <laughs> um but i think it's wildly important and works and i would just encourage everyone to watch i guess this trilogy um not i know just complete and utter brain scramble but i guess that's just how i feel about the film i think this is a film that's really hard to um compartmentalize and like just speak really clearly about because it's, so, it's such mm -hmm. an enigma of reality it's an enigma of narrative it's an enigma of perspective that you just can't really describe you just have to experience and i think it yeah. works <laughs> yeah um, i think every, every scene in here yeah it's I, I, like you mentioned it beforehand like kind of in passing i was like oh yeah there was actually a moment that stuck stood out to me but then again like it moves on to something else but like yeah. there's this machine where people just feed it inputs and it spouts out different forms of art until there's enough fame for people to get like autographs and be that type of fame. It's like, man, it's like the comedy. Is, is he talking about the commodification of art and, and people just chasing clout and doing anything because they're giving it something that exists already and kind of copying. It's like, what? what? This is 1960. Like, and there was something it that feels like was already in his mind. It feels like, like right now, if someone put that in a film, I'd be like, oh, they're talking about like AI and they're talking about like, not film twitter directly but like that idea of just spouting out like words and like how is this idea from all these years ago still like so relevant because it's like and that's the thing about couture and that's the thing about i guess human expression in general is like mm -hmm. unless you tie it if you go just on like big ideas and you make up your iconography as long as you don't tie it to like a specific specific iconography and even then you can and it will work like Ideas are timeless, right? Mm -hmm. Ideas, concerns, worries, fears, just with the nature of how modern society is, at least, you know, in the context of our small bu bubble of what we know as modern society, it's universal and it lives on. It, you know, the names change, the concerns change, but I, I mean, I guess in some ways I'm even taking back to like, look at the strikes right now with the Writers Guild and the Actors Guild. Yeah. And like, it feels so in this moment of a sense of like, oh, this is something brand new because we've never had streaming services, we've never had AI, but this has been a repeating factor that, you know, go back to the invention of radio, go back to the invention of TV, go back to like all these things. And these are conversations and emotions and fears and experiences we just have over and over again. Um I, I think it's just, it's, his work lives on 
just as being incredibly so relevant for today in a way I don't see from a lot of filmmakers. Um, I think it's really easy to get lost in it and just feel like he is alive. And I guess, you know, credit to him, he is alive in some ways, I guess, then. Um, yeah, yeah he I made, know. He made art because he believed in it. I, that, that's something that's yeah. present in all three movies in one yeah. way or another. It's like, why, do you, why, why does an artist create art? And you have some artists who just, again, chase clout, chase fame, chase money. Yeah. Uh, some of them have success as well, so you know, good for them, I guess. Sure. Um, but all three of these artists, like you have the poet, you have Orfe or Orpheus, mm. and you have Jean Cocteau himself. It's like they all chase something more. They're all consumed by it. They're all obsessed with losing it and death. But they all, like you said, live on in the end. Yeah, and he loves it. He loves that. And I think that love shines through. Um, so I guess let's transition a little bit into like overall thoughts on the trilogy. Over, I mean, we've kind of already gotten into it, but if we have any last things we want to say, I guess, about the trilogy as a whole, I will start by saying I think everyone should watch this. I mean, obviously, mm-hmm. um, if there's a trilogy with, I would say, two five-star films at this point, I'm willing to say, um, plus, Ooh. you know, a really solid adaptation of Orpheus, I will say. Um you know, I think not only foundational, I think you watch this and you have a new, pr- like, profound understanding of some of the roots of people like Lynch or just modern mm-hmm. filmmaking in a lot of ways. Um, but just incredibly relevant, you know, incredibly, I mean, everyone says they want to support diverse voices in film history. Bitch, go support it, you know? Um, so <laughs> I, I just, I highly appreciate John Couture. Um I think he deserves to be seen as one of the best filmmakers of all time. I tweeted that. I truly believe it. I think he is like, if I had to look at my favorite filmmakers of all time, it's a, like even on a narrow condensed list, I think he finds a way on there. Um, I am very happy that we have a space to talk about him and a reason for me to watch these films because magnificent. Um, do you have any last words, Nick? without Jean Cocteau and the Orphic trilogy, I probably wouldn't be here right now. So, you know, um, it's very important, very personal for me. Um, yeah, just just watch them. Just I, 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 I And especially, they're, they're just very fun movies. I thought that maybe Testament of Orpheus is the hardest one to get through because it's very metaphysical and philosophical in ways that the others really aren't. Like, it, it reaches a whole new level of just spouting philosophies like you could just stop after every quote and just write it down and it would be just just poetry just pure poetry um but it's just a fun fun and enjoyable trilogy to watch uh I, it makes me fall in love with movies again with poetry again just with art just it, it inspires me i think that's what's truly fundamental about this that they are what 91 50 whatever like all over 16 70 years old at this point uh all three of them and they still hold up they're still capable of moving new people like if 20 year olds like us can well, in, the, in their 20s <laughs> i mean uh can can enjoy it in the year 2023 like it's, it's 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 insane it's insane there's movies from 10 years ago from 10 months ago that already feel outdated <laughs> tired they don't have right. that much to say or they're trying way too hard to say something um and instead he's just you know jean cocteau is economical yeah. he knows what he wants to say and damn it he said it and yeah just bravo bravo what, yeah. a, what a legend it really are projects like this that remind me of why I love cinema. And I think it's sometimes just naturally, this is not, you know, whether you're watching old or new films, I think sometimes it's easy to lose that clear definition in your head and in your soul Mm -hmm. of like, why I love this art form so much. And it is because of stuff like this. So absolutely. Um, Let's transition over to our question of the week, which we're asking this week, a big one. What is your favorite film trilogy? Nick, I believe you have a more inspired take, so I'm going to go first. Um, I really struggled with this because all my answers, my thing I like with these questions is trying to be like as um, like to the question as possible. So there's so many films. Like obviously the Matrix trilogy, easy answer, but now there's a fourth film. So I'm like, oh, I don't don't want to say that. And I don't want to be like uh, the loser who picks what we talk about on the podcast, which right now I probably would genuinely pick the Orphic trilogy. Um, So I really was thinking and what I landed on, you know, is it the best trilogy ever? Maybe not. I don't know. Um, 
I picked the Unbreakable trilogy by M. Night Shyamalan. I oh, am one nice. of those freaks. I am one of those freaks who love glass. Go check out, yes. I believe it was on Uncut Gems, me and Jack for like two hours, to like just worshiping that film and trying to convince the world to love it. Um, obviously, I like Split. Unbreakable is great. Um, I think this is Shyamalan at his best and how he ends that. And tr- again, I mean, everyone loves the twist, right? Of M. Night Shyamalan. That's the gimmick. But he truly takes a narrative and um goes against what you expect and it really is fantastic so i'm gonna pick that also i just like picking m night Shyamalan. i'll love to give him a bone wherever i can so is it the best you know maybe not but i'm gonna pick it for me i'm gonna pick it that's just because mamma mia free isn't out yet that's so true 2025 2025 (laughs) it's it's coming (laughs) it's coming nick gets nick gets it guys that's why we bring him on the podcast now let's hear your answer that i'm sure is going to be a straightforward clean trilogy of course, it's just going to be one pick. There's not going to be multiple picks in here. I'm not going right. to cheat in one way or another. Uh, because I was looking, I was like, what, what can I pick for this? Like you mentioned, there's a lot of, oh man, that trilogy was great. Oh no, there's more than three now. <laughs> it's like, no, 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 can't do it. Uh, then I was like, man, can I pick the Rugrats trilogy? You know, that's that's a, that's a good one. They go to Paris in the second one. It's globetrotting. They end up on an island in the first survival movie. Crossover. That's kind of like an Avengers Endgame for Cartoon Network or whatever it was. No, uh, I was tempted. Do I go the kind of like the, the the cinephile route with you know they have the Free Colors trilogy? You have the Human Condition. Right. Everyone's talking about Oppenheimer and Japanese representation of the war. It's like you could just fucking watch the Human Condition. <laughs> it's in free movies that talk about World War Two from a Japanese perspective that are amazing. I was like, no, it's a bit too much. Do I go with the Souvenir, which is a more recent trilogy because you know uh, the Eternal Daughter? It's basically the souvenir part three. I was like, ah, not really. That would have been a fun pick. <laughs> it would have been a fun pick, though. I, but I need to rewatch all three of them. I love them a lot. Um, I was like, do I go with the fun route? Kind of like the Evil Dead trilogy? But then that's a mess mm-hmm. because you have multiple Evil Dead movies in the show. I was like, ah, oh. do I go with the boring, like the Godfather trilogy? I was like, no, 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 no. I'm going officially favorite trilogy, which is expected cliched but the before trilogy by richard linklater is yeah. just it's just gold uh just absolute gold i've seen these movies like they've been with me at this point for over 10 years wow <laughs> like this we're going back in we're talking about you know late 2012 watching schmoes no whatever the hell uh, oh yeah I was, I was like oh of oh, course man, movies 2012 I was like oh before midnight oh it's a trilogy i kind of like ethan Hawke. i don't really know him that much mom do you want to watch these movies and we watched them like one day after the other and, and it was a uh, i don't want to say life-changing but it was definitely like holy shit this is amazing that was like 10 years ago over 10 years ago i rewatched before sunrise like last month absolutely it killed me absolutely killed me <laughs> visiting it. it was like the seventh time watching it or something uh i love these movies so much so so much everyone's probably seen them so it's it's kind of one of those recommendations like well of course everyone everyone knows them but Right. It's a good reason. It's so it's the best it's the best romantic trilogy of all time, you know. It's just so good. Bro, it was Chris Stuckman that told me about these films. Um Chris I, I'm I don't know if Jeremy I'm, Jones had it in this topic. <laughs> I don't think he ever did, but maybe. Um, I have a secret I'm going to tell everyone right now, and I just want everyone to remember Clappercast for both, you know, you and hosts, a safe space. Uh, my dirty little secret, I've never seen these films. I want to. I know they're on my list. I know. I know they're on my list. I've been oh, waiting no. for like I don't know the right time, but I've never seen these. Um, I know. I know everyone. And now I've lost. Rotten Tomatoes called. I lost my. Everyone ca- canceled me now. But, no, I'm, um, I'm so happy. I, like honestly, like experiencing them for the first time. Oh. The oh. issue is I get films like that, which I know are like you know, seen by everyone as the best films ever. And I want to give them the right, like, I want to give them the right energy and the right time of day. And I Mm -hmm. always just Mm -hmm. like push them off until then. I'm never like, oh, casually, let's get through the trilogy. So like, I'm just waiting for the right time. But I promise everyone I I really want to because I love Linklater. So I'll get there. Just not now. I I, I get it. I get it. I've I've had multiple movies where I watched them because I like everyone loves it. I guess I'll have to watch it then. And I wasn't a fan. But then like cut to a couple years, uh, three, four years later. I was just like, you know what? Let's just give it another shot, and it works. So it's it's always I, I I always say like it's always best to put off a movie that you think that you know you're going to like, but you're just not feeling it because if you're not feeling it, it's not it's gonna work. It's just not right. Gonna work. 
Right. Oh I kind of want to do, I know that some people have talked about doing like um, spending a day and doing one at sunrise, one at sunset, one at midnight. Oh, nice. I think that would be fun. I'm just, again, waiting for the right day, but I, I do, everyone's on the list. And just have that know at home. Don't feel bad that you haven't seen every movie that people say is great because there's a lot of them. There's so many movies and everyone has blind spots and that's so valid. There's um, always a first time to discover something. Like, oh, yes. like if I think about my favorite movies, the first time was always the most special one. So, yes. No rush. <laughs> right. Absolutely. Um, so with that, let's go to our rapid reviews. This is our time where we can talk about anything we saw recently, um, good or bad, that you want to just quickly spend a minute on. Nick, you can go ahead first. What is your rapid review for this week? Uh, super like, I've, I've, I've been rewatching a lot of movies uh, with my with my family recently. I've been in a rewatch mood. Uh, and I have to say the two best ones, uh, All the Beauty and the Bloodshed, finally watched it in full. I didn't... I. I watched like half of it at the Venice Film Festival because I slept through the other half because it was the fifth movie after an entire day of movie watching at 10 p.m. Just I, uh, So I didn't review it. I was fair. I was like, I'm not going to review it because it's just wrong. Uh, and I've seen it all and it's amazing. It's so great. Uh, and also I've rewatched uh, freaking, speaking of movies that like, I didn't really love the first time around because I had to watch them. Uh, the Night of the Hunter. Just what a, what a, what a picture. What a picture. Amazing. Uh, in terms of non-recommendations, just watching The Witcher season three on Netflix. Uh, just no. Just please. I don't know why we're, why we're pushing through with that. <laughs> uh, uh, just pain and suffering. Just, just God, I don't want to watch Netflix anymore. <laughs> you know? Just uh, Anyway, Carson. Valid. Carson, your, yes. your choices. Your I'll say quickly. All the beauty in the bloodshed, the scene in the Met and the Egyptian wing, that's the room I broke down crying in. So I always see that. I'm like, oh, I remember that room very well. You said it was like, um, do you mean the Sackler wing? <laughs> right, right. It's like a slur now. Just poof. So just say it. not going to lie, we pre-record uh, some of these. So a little bit dated, what I'll say. I rewatched The Meg, the first one. And I must hey. say, y'all, I really like really like this film and i like i don't know i think number one it's just so fun but like i really respect it in a sense i think like what it does with this gimmick it could have been so lazy but both in visual effects and just like in conceptually what they do with this i think they do so much more than they ever need to and i mean that in the best of ways i also mm -hmm. think jason statham is like genuinely giving a career defining performance here i think this is just like when it comes to this genre this type of film I, it's hard for me to imagine it getting much better than the Meg. I think the entire ensemble's great, memorable characters, memorable action scenes. It's just like it's a big, fun shark, and I'm excited for the next one, though I'm yes. interested. And in, hey, everyone will know what it's like now, but I'm very curious with that director choice. Um, I also yes. Oh, yes. watched Jeez. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Mutant Mayhem. I only mention because at the beginning of the year, some people pick this as their most anticipated for the year. I didn't because I don't have any history with the Ninja Turtles. Um <laughs> I know people are liking it. All I will say is it was oh, not for boy. me. It was okay. not Carson Tamar's cup of tea. But if you like the Ninja Turtles, maybe you'll like it more than I did. That's all I'm saying. Um, so I'm a turtle guy. No, I love hey, pizza. Me too. Same. Same. Hard same. It should, it should be um, like, you know, Garfield and lasagna. Same thing. I love Garfield. Love lasagna. See, we're the same. But Teenage Mutant <laughs> Ninja Turtles just, just doesn't. I don't know. Right. It just something about it never really clicked for me. But valid everyone um so that nick where can we find you on social media you can follow me on twitter and instagram at nickygran97 just always sharing weird thoughts and reviews and there, there's links to my letterbox my my short films on youtube and vimeo all the good stuff all the good stuff yes and you can find if you want to watch the short films link below um okay. you can find me on twitter at bp underscore movie reviews letterbox just carson tamar Thank you so much for watching this episode. I'm so excited that Clappercast, we've now created a space where we can have an episode like this, talking about great cinema from the past. We'll be back in a couple weeks to discuss, oh, Nick, we're talking about John Wick Chapter 4 in two weeks, which I'm very excited for. Um, and I think you might want to be on that because I think I, you know, I think you like the film. I'm not too sure about that. Clean um, five hours of your schedule for that episode because we're going deep. <laughs> right, right, deep right. Deep right. week. Uh, you can find us on Patreon, subscribe and support the podcast there. A District 9 review with Jack Luke Sharp just dropped. We also have our Portrait of the Lady on Fire review, which is very relevant to this episode. Um, and just in general, thank you so much for watching. And we'll be back in two weeks. See you then.